not, uh, it's not the best uh, choice. I find electrodesiccation using the lowest effective setting is, is a far better choice in this instance. And uh, very light curettage, if necessary, for the larger seborrheic keratoses. Similarly, for the smaller variety of the DPNs, the Dermatosis papulosa nigra, I'll use a very, very careful light electrodesiccation, sometimes with, for the very small lesions using an epilating needle, so so focused uh, so that you really minimize any perilesional uh, uh, damage. Um, and instead of curetting these off or rubbing them off or scraping them off, uh, I, I, leave the, I leave them untouched and have them come off over, uh, spontaneously over the course of three to seven days after the procedure. For rejuvenation uh, or, or for uh, uh, reduction of volume loss, uh, fillers are uh, extremely uh, if, uh, useful here and very safe in darker skin. However, there is a risk, uh, there is a slight uh, increased risk for hyperpigmentation, and this has been shown in a number of studies, including this with this uh, uh, study with the hyaluronic acid dermal filler, where you can see that with increased Fitzpatrick type, there was an uh, 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 increased risk of hyperpigmentation. So being mindful of the number of punctures and the uh, trying to minimize the overall injury to the epidermis is, is important here to minimize the risk of dyschromia. Botulinum toxin has been used safely across the spectrum of skin types. There are numerous studies in different populations, including African Americans and Asians and, and, uh, um, and Latin Americans. And so this can be used safely and with the same approaches that we do in any other uh, group. There aren't any real nuances there, except for sometimes some of the, uh, the goals, uh, the aesthetic goals that the patient might have might vary from population to population. What about skin tightening and body contouring? We're seeing a growth of devices that uh, um, um, offer improvements in this area, including radio frequency, ultrasound, infrared, and cryolipolysis. And these are generally safe in all skin types since melanin is not the target. Uh, but if in the event of poor technique, uh, you can still run the risk of disfiguring uh, pigmentary uh, problems uh, such as this. This is uh, from deep tissue ultrasound. Should be a safe procedure. That melanin has nothing to do with it. Um, uh, but with poor technique causing uh, epidermal injury here, this woman has um, severe hyperpigmentation as a result of the procedure. This patient using another device. This is an infrared skin tightening device. Again, theoretically and, and in reality, safe for all skin types. But if you have poor technique, for example, not placing the handpiece properly, having direct contact uh, in, with enough pressure uh, and even pressure on the skin, you can heat up the epidermis and cause a thermal, uh, cause a thermal injury or burn. And this woman was left with uh, actually permanent uh, depigmentation in this area. So one, even when uh, we are exposed to all of these devices that are marketed now as colorblind, safe for all skin types, we must still uh, remember uh, to use them cautiously and make sure maintain excellent technique. So putting it all together, when facing a, a patient who come, presents to our offices with a, a whole host of aesthetic uh, skin aging concerns, including uh, prominent uh, nasolabial folds and dynamic rhytids, uh, uh, tear trough deformity, um, we have various tools to address each and every one in our darker skin patient. For the tear trough deformity, uh, uh, we can use an HA filler. The textural irregularities, including large pores, roughness, dullness, the retinoids in combination with superficial chemical peels such as salicylic acid, uh, photo rejuvenation, such as the microsecond ND YAG or non-ablative fractional. For hyperpigmentation, we have our topical bleaching agents as well as our chemical peels. For the nasolabial folds, the injectable fillers again. And for laxity, we have our uh, radio frequency and infrared uh, devices, which can be used safely, but again, uh, with using excellent technique uh, to avoid uh, excessive epidermal injury. So in summary, there are some variations in uh, the skin aging concerns in, in this dar darker uh, end of the skin spectrum, including dyschromias, textural irregularities, benign growths, and, uh, and as in other groups, uh, rhytids and volume loss. 
Um, and the key to doing this safely is always thinking about minimizing the extent of epidermal and dermal injury uh, when performing our, our procedures. And uh, so ju judicious treatment selection and technique is paramount here. Thank you. Okay, sure. So if you could bring up the next talk, which is the uh, men of African ancestry, I think labeled as 915 perhaps, yeah. All right. So men of African ancestry are a group, uh, a subset of the population that share some common characteristics when it comes to hair, hair shaft uh, shape and texture and hair follicle uh, structure, as well as a, a bunch of, uh, of skin and hair grooming practices which are quite common across the very wide uh, diaspora of men of African ancestry. This is a geographically diverse group with uh, large populations obviously in the African continent, but uh, throughout uh, many other parts of the world, including North America, of course, large populations in the Caribbean, Central America, South America, especially Brazil, uh, and immigrant populations all around the world, but it's, uh, with high concentrations in, in many parts of Europe. So this is a global population uh, that share some common uh, characteristics and have a number of dermatologic disorders that disproportionately affect this group. And in some, in some cases, it's almost exclusive uh, to, to this population. So pseudophilic colitis barbae is one such uh, problem that is extremely common in men of Africa, African ancestry and much more common in, in this group versus um, uh, other groups. Another issue is acne keloidalis nucae. And these are the two uh, disorders that I'm going to be talking about this morning. So both of these uh, entities, pseudofolliculitis barbae or PFB and acne keloidalis nucae, primarily affect men of African ancestry. They share a chronic course. They are dis cosmetically dis disfiguring. And unfortunately, our treatment options uh, to, are, have historically been limited, but there have been some, some recent advances that have really improved the care of these patients. We don't have very much research into, this, into these entities, unfortunately. So uh, uh, we, we're dealing with uh, very few clinical trials and sm very small case series and a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence here. Uh, and if left untreated uh, and, and, the more, and left to progress to more severe form, there can be long-term sequelae, including scarring, alopecia, pigmentary abnormalities, and in, in, in many cases, some degree of psychosocial impact. So let's begin with pseudofolliculitis barbae, which is by, by far the, the most common uh, uh, of these entities in this population. It's reported to affect between 45 and 83 percent of black men. It, historically, it's been the source of racial tensions in the U.S. military, as well as other workplaces where a clean-shaven face is required, where uh, Individuals who have difficulty shaving every single day because of pseudofolliculitis barbae are sort of uh, alienated from the rest of the group. So this has produced racial tensions. Uh, and uh, uh, clinically, I think we all know what this looks like. They're basically razor bumps. And one, when one looks uh, more closely, we see hair shafts, coarse hair shafts that being curly in nature have sort of re-entered the uh, epidermis and produce an inflammatory reaction. So we see a collection of inflamed papules, sometimes pustules, and often uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can be a quite conspicuous feature of this, a, 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 a very common sequela of this problem. In more severe cases and in among those who are more likely to form keloids, this can be the trigger for keloids on the uh, beard area. As I mentioned, uh, the pathogenesis is it's basically a foreign body reaction to uh, hair keratin. And because of the curly shape of the, of the hair in this population, coupled with the sharp tip that is formed after shaving, there's a, a, an increased tendency for the hair to re-enter uh, uh, the epidermis and dermis and produce an uh, inflammatory reaction, a foreign body reaction. It can re-enter from the outside in, as shown in the schematic, and that's called extra follicular penetration. But it can also uh, enter the epidermis and dermis uh, without exiting the skin surface. And very close shaving, if you 
clip the hair just below the skin surface, for example, pulling the skin very taut and using a multi-bladed razor to get that extra close shave, you can uh, clip the hair just below the skin surface and that sharp tip can then re-enter into the epidermis and dermis. And that's called transfollicular penetration and that produces even more inflammation. But in addition to this mechanical etiology, in, in, in the past few years, there's actually been uh, some work that suggested a genetic predisposition, at least in a subset of men. This was done in a military base in Germany. And uh, uh, what they found was that the frequency of a mutation in keratin 75 uh, was uh, higher in, among patients with PFB versus in controls, 36% versus 9%, and this was highly statistically significant. So what is keratin-75 and where is it found? Keratin-75 is found uh, in the lining of the hair follicle, if you will. It's between the outer root sheath and the inner root sheath. It's in the so-called companion layer. And the thought is that if you have a structurally weakened companion layer because you have a companion layer because you have this keratin-75 mutation, plus the curly hair shaft, plus the uh, uh, issue of close shaving, you have an increased risk for ingrown hair. So this is an, another factor that might play a role in a subset of these men who have PFB. So how do we uh, approach uh, these patients? So this, well, let's use this case as an example. This is a 29-year-old young professional uh, with very, he, he wishes to shave daily and, uh, and has uh, very severe papules and hyperpigmentation and he's presenting to our office. So what, what can we offer this, this gentleman? Well, in the initial consultation, I like to pre present uh, the broad range of options because, it, because there's m many different, uh, there are pros and cons to, to each approach, and it's worth having the patient understand what, what the options are. And it begins with the most conservative, which is just to discontinue shaving and grow a beard, because it turns out that if you discontinue shaving, in approximately six to eight weeks, the vast majority of these cases will spontaneously uh, resolve after approximately one centimeter or growth, the, even the embedded hairs spontaneously release themselves, and then the inflammation will subside and, and uh, the bumps go away. Chemical depilatories can be used, however, they do have their limitations, and we'll talk about that. For those that wish to continue shaving, that can be done with some tweaking and modification of their shaving practices. And uh, one factor that, that I find extremely common if you actually ask the patients is tweezing. They, they, there's a lot of pulling, digging into the skin to pull out these embedded hairs, and that, that produces more inflammation and hyperpigmentation, and so discontinuation of that is an important uh, uh, recommendation. So when it comes to the beard thing, uh, growing beards, it used to be, until recently, it was kind of a hard sell to tell patients to grow a beard. Uh, but fortunately, uh, beards have be are at an all-time high in popularity, and uh, uh, we're seeing all sorts of uh, famous people and trendsetters uh, sporting the beard. And uh, in fact, the full beard has become synonymous with urban cool, uh, and uh, so much so that there's even beard envy. Uh, those that can't grow that nice full beard are actually paying thousands of dollars uh, to get uh, facial hair transplants, apparently. So this is a new trend. So the, the beard option is not, not too bad nowadays. Uh, and it's more acceptable in a lot of workplaces. So, uh, so when appropriate, uh, patients can, can go down this route. So what's the evidence that this works? So in a nice study that was actually published in JAMA in 1979, uh, uh, looked at uh, 96 U.S. Air Force men who had pseudofolliculitis barbae. They were told to grow their, hair, grow their beard for a month, and, uh, and then uh, after a month, shave, crop the beard with an electric clippers, leaving uh, 0.5 to 1 millimeter uh, length. So nice, well-groomed beard. And this resulted in uh, uh, 91 out of the 96 subjects having uh, uh, improvement in their PFB. What about chemical depilatories? So chemical depilatories come in two types. There's the, the, the first generation of, uh, uh, of these products where there's a powder uh, that's made of barium sulfide. It requires mixing with water. It's, uh, it does have a, it's, it's not aesthetically pleasing. It has a malodorous uh, 
uh, quality when you mix it, and it's very, it's, uh, it, it can be very irritating. So you want to be very careful with the contact time on the skin. It should never be left on to the point of, of uh, significant stinging or burning. So, but when used with caution, it's, it, it is an option for, for hair removal. And uh, the way these work is by weakening disulfide bonds in the keratin, and uh, then the hair is removed from the skin surface with a, with a blunt spatula. The newer generation ones are, are cream form, and they are calcium thioglycolate, and these are much more aesthetically acceptable. However, they're less effective than the traditional powders, but uh, less risk of irritant contact dermatitis. And this is an example of the type of irritation you can see immediately after or day after, these little pink erosions uh, following a chemical depilatory. So it is an option, but it needs to be used with caution, and, and there's a lot of uh, patient uh, education goes into it. What about those that wish to continue to shave? So one can continue to shave as long as we modify uh, techniques to re reduce uh, extra follicular and transfollicular penetration. And there's debate over whether a single blade or multiple blade razors are useful. Traditionally, we've recommended single blade razors because they're less likely to uh, produce such a close shave where the sharp tip uh, re-enters, forming transfollicular penetration. Electric clippers are often recommended, leaving, just like in the military study where you leave 0.5 to 1 millimeter of stubble, that's often a, a, a good option. And when it comes to shaving technique, wet shaving, when it comes to wet shaving, you want to uh, advise patients to wash, uh, before shaving, wash the face with a mild cleanser uh, and or face cloth uh, to gently, to not first of all, to hydrate the, the uh, facial hair, which is, creates a, a much more comfortable and less irritating shave, but also uh, with a circular motion with a, with a washcloth and doing it gently, you can gently release these embedded hairs and uh, that's helpful uh, in terms of minimizing PFB. You want to use a moisturizing uh, shaving cream or gel and uh, use a sharp, a single blade razor, or in some instances, even multiple blade razors with appropriate technique can be okay. But shaving with the direction, in the direction of growth, that's uh, with the grain, in other words, and avoiding stretching or pulling of the skin. After shaving, using topical anti-inflammatory products and, and nightly retinoid uh, can be useful. So as far as all of these instructions, uh, there's a useful uh, video and written instruction sheet that you can find on the a American Academy of Dermatology website. So www.aad.org, and you search for shaving video, and you can find this video, which uh, you can direct patients to, and that sort of emphasizes these, these techniques. Tweezing, I, rec I, I mentioned before, this should be avoided, and it's all, I'm, almost 100% of patients do admit to doing this. It's, all, it's irresistible, uh, but uh, this really contributes to some of the inflama inflammation and the dispigmentation that we see. As far as actual topical treatments, there are very few studies in this area, but this is uh, one of the few, which is a multi-center, double-blinded, uh, uh, controlled study using benzoyl peroxide 5%, clindamycin 1%, gel formulation. And the bottom line is, is that the combination of benzoyl peroxide clindamycin in the study uh, produced, demonstrated uh, greater reduction in papule and pustule counts than uh, a vehicle. Topical retinoids can be useful. Uh, these were studied way back in the early 70s and more recently uh, in, the, uh, in the past 10 years using topical tazeratine uh, as an example here in this small study of 12 weeks. So I frequently will use a topical retinoid in the evening and a topical uh, benzoyl peroxide clindamycin formulation in the morning. For very inflammatory cases, limited use of a low potency corticosteroid immediately after shaving uh, is, is, uh, is also useful. But there are cases that just don't respond to all of the above, and we might need to do some in-office procedures, including chemical peels for short-term improvement, and salicylic acid uh, peels 20% or 30% can be useful for this. But much uh, uh, more robust results and long-term results would come from laser hair removal. And this has really changed the game uh, as far as treatment of these patients. The development of longer wavelength lasers that can be used safely in darker skin um, is, is, has really produced a lot of benefit for uh, pseudofollicolitis barbae patients. And uh, this study shows the use of the long-pulsed NDAG 1064 laser in combination with topical eflornithine cream. And 
And so this uh, demonstrated that the combination of topical eflornithine, which is a cream that, uh, is, that slows down uh, the, the blocks a step, blocks an enzyme that's useful in the uh, hair growth cycle, if you use that in combination with laser hair removal, it appears to produce a greater and more rapid reduction in hair counts and papule counts. So that's an option to, to consider. Now, acne keloids dialis nuca, the second condition I'm going to talk about this morning, is, uh, is characterized by these fibrotic keloid-like uh, papules on the back of the scalp. They're, it's not acne, and it's not keloid, uh, and it's not uh, pseudophilicolitis barbi either, but it's called acne keloidalis nuca, or AKN. And uh, it, in many cases, it can be relatively mild with small papules just involving the lower part of the uh, uh, posterior scalp. And this photo comes from a, a great paper, uh, and, the, and the authors are in the room, actually. Uh, the, Dr. Shapiro, uh, the father and son team sitting at that table, published this paper a few years ago. Um, in severe cases, uh, these papules can kind of coalesce and produce a, a larger uh, keloidal plaque. And in some cases, uh, you can get tufts of hair emerging from this fibrotic plaque. And this can often can become secondarily infected. It might have a boggy texture, tenderer, it could be suppurative. In very severe cases, it can extend far beyond just the nape of the neck or uh, posterior hairline and go all the way up uh, to the vertex uh, in, in some more advanced uh, cases. Uh, this is extremely common in, in, in one study in London. It was the second most common diagnosis in adults in a, in a clinic that uh, is in a neighborhood that's predominantly Caribbean in London. A study done in the Midwest of the U.S. Uh, found that this was more frequent in African-American football players compared to their age-matched non-football player controls, suggesting a frictional component from, from hel attributed to helmets in, in this instance. So friction ap appears to play a role. Patients often blame the barber. They think that they often say, well, the barber used dirty clippers on my head and that's how I got this. That's a widespread uh, um, myth. Uh, but uh, the friction of the electric Clippers can certainly uh, contribute to, to this disorder and certainly exa exacerbate it. We still don't fully know the etiology. There, there have been uh, a number of theories, including a chronic low-grade folliculitis, uh, again, mechanical irritation, which I, I favor, uh, as do uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, the Shapiros, who published that paper I mentioned. And uh, a histopathologic study uh, done on 19 uh, speci specimens from 10 patients concluded that acne keloidalis nuke has the features of a primary scarring alopecia, lacking any evidence of ingrown hairs or any bacterial overgrowth. So what do we do for these patients? Well, we, we begin with uh, some behavior modification, avoiding the, the, the uh, component of mechanical irritation from very low haircuts and, and, and uh, very forceful use of electric clippers on the back of the head. Um, other sources include tight-fitting caps, helmets, or collars, uh, anything that would produce friction. But patients themselves, so this is often an area that patients chronically rub and pick and scratch, and that contributes to uh, worsening of this. So patients need to be counseled on reducing the, risk, the tendency to pick and scratch. And we can help, help them along by using topical corticosteroids or, injection, or corticosteroids by injection to reduce the itching and the size of these bumps. So topical steroids, topical antibiotics are, can be useful for, for secondary infection as well as their anti-inflammatory effect. Topical retinoids are somewhat useful. And in cases of secondary infection or very severe, or very inflamed uh, postular forms, uh, oral antibiotics are, are useful. So when it comes to topical corticosteroids, there's a study using uh, uh, clobetazole 0.05% um, uh, foam or betamethasone valerate uh, foam in mild to moderate acne keloidalis nuca. And this demonstrated a, a reduction in mean papule postural count um, from 25 to 10 after 12 weeks. This is an example of one of my patients 
who came in just after two weeks of using clobetazole foam to the area. And to my surprise, that was a very short interval. That's much shorter than I, w I would have expected. But he demonstrated already a significant reduction in the number of papules and the size of the papules. However, for more extensive cases, in addition to topical therapy, especially uh, by extensive, I mean also uh, larger keloidal or fibrotic papules and plaques, uh, topical therapy is just not enough. You are going to need some intralesional corticosteroids. And I favor higher, uh, higher ends of the range of, of concentration for triamcinolone, and I'll routinely go between 20 and 40 milligrams per cc for, for these uh, fibrotic papules, and just being careful to inject directly into the lesion and not uh, too much sublesionally or, or, uh, or perilesionally, because you want to avoid der dermal atrophy and hypopigmentation. Um, when uh, it's more extensive and severe, and particularly when there's pustules, oral doxycycline in particular, it, or minocycline, uh, can be quite helpful. For those that don't respond to more conservative medical treatment, uh, we can consider surgical or laser techniques. When it comes to surgery, um, there's two approaches that are, that are uh, appropriate. One, one which uh, I favor is excision with healing by second intention, uh, and, uh, the, but others do perform a primary closure. Um, the key is, regardless of which surgical technique you choose, um, you want to use a horizontal ellipse that, that extends uh, below the posterior hairline, and the depth, the depth of the excision needs to be uh, down to the subcutis, where the, where the, the, the base of the follicles uh, are, are located. So this is an example of electrosurgical excision of AKN with second intention healing. And you can see just after five weeks, that large defect has, has already healed by second intention. And uh, this can produce some long-lasting results. More recently, lasers have been used to destroy the follicle and, and, and uh, limit hair growth in the, in the affected area. And this has been met with some success. However, one has to be careful of the laser they choose. And uh, uh, this is using the diode laser, which uh, I would uh, not use in someone with type 6 because of the higher risk of, of, of this uh, pigmentation side effect. But uh, much safer would be the long pulse 1064 and EAG, which has recently, be, recently been studied for this entity in a small study of 16 patients who underwent five uh, sessions of laser hair removal with one year follow up. We can see after each session there is a progressive reduction in papule and, and uh, plaque count and size. And so in conclusion, pseudofolliculitis barbie and acne chilodalis nuke are uh, follicular disorders that are primarily seen in men of African ancestry and have a considerable uh, psychosocial impact. Uh, while we have uh, a variety of topical agents and be behavioral modification and now lasers uh, to, uh, uh, you, to utilize laser hair removal, um, we still have many challenges in treating these patients and uh, uh, I hope there will be more research in this area. So with that, I thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Yes. Like the question has to do with lichen planus and, and my approach to treatment. Um, I first of all, I've not observed that lichen planus is more common per se in darker skin, but it, it, it has its own nuances in that it can be more problematic in that the the dispigmentation is more pronounced, and uh, uh, especially uh, even after clearance, the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can last for many months, sometimes years, uh, and that's, that's often the biggest challenge. But in terms of treatment, it really depends on how extensive uh, the, the condition is. For limited areas, I will use class uh, super potent or potent corticosteroids. For more advanced, I'll use oral steroids, uh, short-term course of uh, prednisone for longer term treatment uh, using, in very, very severe cases, I would even consider cyclosporin for limited periods of time for the most resistant, difficult uh, cases. Phototherapy can be used as well, uh, but it still remains a, a, a big challenge. Any other questions? There are microphones as well, so please be free. 
Go ahead. Uh, hi, my, my name is Dr. Taha. Uh, I do some like uh, minor surgeries in my office, like uh, for somebody with a very big, uh, like uh, what was it called? Uh, um, Acne culi dallas nuclei. Yeah, thing? yeah. And, like, is there any specifics about this? Uh, like, is like you, like the like incision you made? Like, what exactly you're doing? You're you're are, are you removing any tissue? Like, uh, so it's a horizontal ellipse. And it should be, the depth is important. You have mm -hmm. to get down to the uh, deep dermis sub-Q junction mm -hmm. where the inferior part, where the bulb of the follicle is located. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's recommended for, for the um, cosmetic and functional, uh, having the best cosmetic and functional result after surgery to include the posterior hairline, sort of where the, where, where the, the, the hair ends. You want to go past that in your, with your ellipse. Sometimes that's not possible. If, if it depends on the location of, where, of the keloidal plaque that you're removing, and that would be a consideration as to whether that would be a good candidate for, for surgery or not. I'd recommend uh, the two publications that I, that I cited, mm -hmm. and I think uh, a handout is available. If not, I, I'm happy to give you that, uh, I would that like reference. To. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Do you have any recommendations for treating hypopigmentation? Hypopigmentation, recommendations for treating hypopigmentation. Big challenge. Um, luckily, it depends on it, you know it depends on the cause of the hypopigmentation. Um, but uh, in most cases of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, there's resolution within within approximately three four months in most cases. But for those uh, more long-lasting cases, using narrowband UVB if it's widespread, or if it's localized, using the eczema laser would be a good strategy for stimulating more uh, uh, pigmentation in a shorter period of time. But like with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, we want to address the underlying inflammatory uh, disease. And so if, it, if the hypopigmentation is caused by something like seborrheic dermatitis, which would be a chronic re recurring uh, uh, inflammatory disorder of the face. You want to ensure that you're addressing the, the primary disorder. Otherwise, there'll be ongoing persistent hypopigmentation. So in that instance, I, I tend to use um, topical um, calcineurin inhibitors, such as uh, uh, pimecrolimus or topical uh, tacrolimus. Uh, over the course of 12 weeks or more, uh, controlling the inflammation, and then you'll see repigmentation in that time frame. How yes. One, how does one decide how much of the steroid to uh, uh, inject, and uh, is it based upon a surface area, or is it based on uh, uh, the thickness of the keloid, mm -hmm. and also? Um, when we do give it, do we give it with one single injection or can we give multiple uh, penetrations? Okay, so a question has to do with technique for intralesional uh, triamcinolone injection. And all the factors you mentioned play a role. The, the size, the location, the, uh, um, the thickness of the, of the lesion that you're injecting. Uh, but in general, if you're going to be using higher strengths as, as, uh, as I frequently do, um, you want to control the amount of volume. It's very, we're talking about very small volumes here, 0 0.01, 0 0.01 to 0.02 cc's with every uh, uh, puncture. Uh, and w the position of the needle, uh, I would recommend that it be within the lesion and not under the lesion uh, uh, and not beyond the lesion. But uh, um, when starting out, it's to be to err on the side of caution. Starting with 10 milligrams per cc would probably be a, a good choice. And as you get more more experience, moving it up uh, to uh, closer to 40 uh, in the right when it's appropriate for the more severe, inf uh, larger fibrotic plaques and papules. It's a question over here on this side. Yeah, hi, I'm a family doctor in the city in Toronto. Um, you mentioned for tex textual irregularities using um, retinoids like. Um, it, and then you also mentioned salicylic acid. How would you um, recommend that for a patient? Like, would they use retinoid nightly and then do salicylic acid during the mm -hmm. day or the peels once a month? Or how would you sort of, just practically speaking, for family practice okay. patients? Great. So practically speaking, how do we incorporate retinoids and, and chemical peels and lasers and things for textural irregularities? So I'm glad you asked the question.